Look how this man has managed to adapt to the new technology. He's just zooming from one interview to the next. And so, you're not you're not doing so bad yourself. It's good. I've got used to it now. I didn't like the idea to start with, but I quite like doing interviews. The results are pretty good uh, if you can see the other person's face. Yeah, and um, as well as hear their voice. It's funny. I was just at a conference uh, last week, and someone was talking about they uh, were, you know, interviewing Jackson Brown, and and Jackson Brown was in his kitchen, and you saw all of Jackson Brown's pots and pans in the kitchen, and I said, you know, that's kind of cool. You can't get that, uh, you know, if you met Jackson Brown in a room somewhere at some hotel, it's not the same thing. It's kind of cool. I bet he's using that Belgian cast iron gear, though, huh? <laughs> he's you got know? the he's got the good stuff. I bet, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see his, his his knife and tool collection, spatulas and stuff like that. It, uh, I'm sure it's all top of the line, German and Japanese. But stuff. organic at the same time. So That's right. Organic bamboo handles, I'm imagining. And <laughs> non no nukes, non-nuclear, of course. No nuclear uh, uh, kitchen items. That's it. Got to carry his guitar one afternoon. Oh, yeah? Yeah. A Greenpeace um, benefit show that we'd organised in Arizona. And he was one of the artists that kindly agreed to perform. And the hotel was a walk, a decent walk, but a walk uh, from the stage area. And so he said he was fine. He would uh, just walk back. He wouldn't wait for a van. And uh, I said, OK, I'll walk with you. And... Um, he didn't know who I was or I was in a group or anything like that. I right. didn't mean, uh, I was just green piecing. And, um, and we set off and he had his acoustic guitar and I said, oh, I'll carry that for you. He said, oh, no, I couldn't. I wouldn't dream of it. I said, no, please, I insist. And I did. Wow. Carry his guitar to the hotel. And you had a, had a good nice. conversation on the way, I guess. I didn't get tipped out. You know, I was hoping. You know, yeah, decent, you know, production move like that. Hey, our son, you did all right, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. 50 environmentals right there. But no, but he was very gracious, very nice. Well, good, cool. Well, listen, thanks for taking some time to do this with me today. I'm excited. And, um, you know, we're here today to talk about the reissues of the first two general public albums, All the Rage. I can and see Hands them behind you. That's I, amazing. I actually have ready. not gotten them. I don't have them. I, I was waiting for them. And I, I was at a record store over the weekend and I saw a used copy of Hand to Mouth. And I thought, well, the other one's coming, but it never made its way here. So I usually I like to show them, but I, I didn't get it yet. But uh, but I will. I will get them. Will you wait till the BMG machine rolls into action? That's right. The BMG machine rolling into New Jersey. And uh, and of in, course, in uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> With a Christmas greeting, Alice. You <laughs> get it. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, explain to the audience, of course, you were coming off the English beat and, uh, you know, uh, explain for our audience what that time was like right before you uh, uh, you guys started the new group, you know, what was going on at the time? Well, it's a lot of stuff, really. Yeah. Uh, me and Roger had both started a family. Mm. We had our first kid each, uh, which is a big surprise and hard, I think, to fit in with anybody's life when it happens to, for young dads. Right. But particularly if you're in a group and you're not there half the time because you're on the road gallivanting and promoting records. Uh, and so that was a difficult time for us. It had all become a little bit too much for some of the band and thought we were getting sucked into the rock and roll vortex. Right. That we were only three tours away from having songs on the album about touring. <laughs> right, 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 right. And we were rocking, man! Damn, damn, I'm on Boulevard. I always and, wanted to have a boulevard in one right. of my... And, but, then we put, and then we pulled into Tallahassee. You know, there's got to right. be a, a boulevard in Tallahassee. They wouldn't <laughs> know you were singing about that. It's just the boulevard bit. Oh, right, right. And, um, 
more planes than buses nowadays, they said. Right. And they wanted two years off to walk down the shops, to not do an interview about anything. Right. Uh, to not be in a group, sort of. To just be normal <laughs> and think about things to write songs about from that perspective. Right. They missed that perspective. They need a break. Which you could understand, but me and Roger couldn't really afford it. Right. We'd been a uh, a fairly diligent, with one or two exceptions, a fairly diligent socialist enclave Um in as much as everybody in the band got the same from the songs, recording royalties and publishing royalties. So, and we liked it at the time. It made everybody feel equal. Right. And uh, it made everybody feel, because they were equal, they were free to offer any suggestion they liked. And... uh, whether it got in or not, a different matter, but uh, it did help at the time with the music, but it made for other problems. And me and Roger just couldn't afford two years off. With so you uh, had fa- you had families to raise. Yes, that's right. It's a bit of a new one there. Yeah. Um, so I went down to London at the request of Virgin Records, and they said. It's gone on for too long. We've been months and months and months trying to get a deal with the beat. And every time we get close, we end up getting another list of six to ten things on top of it. Mm. And it's too much. It's like you guys don't want to be in a group or you don't want a record deal. And now we hear, in fact, how often have you want two years off? So... You know, there's no beat deal, but we'd like to offer you a deal. They offered me and Roger a deal Mm. as general. And I said I'd had something in mind. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's pretty amazing, really. Uh, it, it's one thing to be signed to a major label and be in a uh, a popular band. That's one dream come true. But, you know, the the, the guys at the label, uh, the folks at the label must have seen something really in you two and said, Hey, you know, we, we can, we can rely on these guys. These guys can produce some, some music for us that we can use. I mean, that's pretty astonishing. There was magic still there. Yeah. It was how they put it. Mm, interesting. The chemistry still there. And certainly live, there was really all the way to the very end. There was a, a terrific intuitive chemistry like we'd look around and the other one was looking at you. Yeah. Yeah, you guys had that connection. You, you, kind of, you kind of knew they were going to be. Yeah, right. gotcha. Um, which translated sometimes into a terrific performance, and I think that was sometimes where we were at our best. Right. Right. So talk a little bit about, you know, here you were in this transition. Those are some of the reasons. And uh, how, how did you kind of put together the sound that was a little bit different from the beat? Of course, it was, well, it was a lot different. Uh, you know, you still have some of those ska and, and reggae influences that were still creeping in there, but you seem to really be on the move for a pure pop sound. Was, how much did you kind of think about or talk about what the architecture or the sound of the new group was going to be at that time? Gosh, I wish I could say we sat down and had cohesive conversations about architecture. It was really, I think, more just a reaction to what we were hearing. Right. What we just heard for the last three years was Scar. So anybody would want to hear something else. Mm. You know, like Calypso. Oh, yeah, I'll do. <laughs> anything. <laughs> you know, anything. So just naturally... And with the Beats records, the the Beats that had been used were starting to spread wide past Scar or Reggae, more into general syncopation. Right. Um, with maybe a bit more emphasis on Motown, or that sort of soul R&B flavour. Uh and funnily enough, I think that would be true also of Fine Young Cannibals. Mm-hmm. Who turned out they did want need two years off and then come back 
with some songs written from the perspective of not being in a group. Right. right. Turned out quite quite a good idea, it turned out. Mm, yeah, I guess so, for sure. Um, you know, the production on these albums is so tight and uh, clever and it's got that early 80s sound, but it's not, it's not uh dated you know i was really enjoying them uh revisiting them this week and there's so many little flourishes and it's a style that you just don't catch much anymore you know things are a lot of records nowadays are pretty organic and they try to keep things simple and uh but this is a whole different process of arranging and production and i wondered if you could just uh you know share with everybody uh, you know kind of what was going on in the studio how did you kind of keep those tracks so tight um and who was, you know, like who was throwing around all those ideas? And it just seemed like a right. very exciting, uh, they're very exciting tracks. And I just wonder if you recall anything about putting it was them a together. struggle. Yeah. It was a struggle. Um, but it was an exciting struggle because it was juggling too many good ideas. Right. To the time. Or oh, you could do this. And you're like, yeah, you could, but it would make everything else have to do that. And, um, we had Mickey Billingham uh, recently of Dexy's, the arranger of Come On Eileen, who knew his way around the piano pretty good. And he came up with a lot of interesting parts. Uh, but Roger had also become the owner of two or three synthesizers, which he spent just all day and all night playing one finger melodies on. Right. So when we got to the studio, it was hard to stop him. And uh, it was a battle. I sometimes, I if I was lucky, I got to be the referee and I could set him and Mickey against each other hmm. <laughs> by having Mickey pointing out that the melody Roger was playing with the one finger is actually incorporated in the keyboard part. You're right. That he'd already recorded, which is pr probably why he'd heard it now. Right, <laughs> right. You're duplicating what I already did. Oh, I don't care. It sounds I've cool. I've got an it's idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. got an idea. And so that became the call sign in the studio. Oh, oh dear. I've yeah. got an idea. I've got an idea. Do, 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 do. And... Um, now, the, but the best of it was fantastic. So you had to be uh, generous, uh, let the parts go down, and then try and find, as you called it, a sort of amusing uh, arrangement of it. Right. And so there's a lot of disparate melodies that crop in and out, but we managed in the main part to fit them around Mickey's rather tried and trusted classically correct keyboard part um and they fit together quite seamlessly so that was that was good but it was a struggle um just for a joke the ones we just we cut everything else out except for the vocals and all of roger's 12 keyboard ideas right <laughs> and you got enough there really it sounded smashing right was that? I don't know why we bother coming in. We should just do a guide track. Well, I imagine that it, it, when it came you. when it came time for mixing, it must have even been uh, even harder, you know, to decide what stays and what goes, and uh, listen, you know, comparing it because there was a lot of. I mean, even the percussive parts, you know, there's so much little yeah. interesting per percussion things happening, and uh, it's just uh, the word I keep coming back to is so tight. It was so. Uh, those yeah. records are just the so saving cramped. rate was that although Roger liked a lot of parts, he was very fond of things starting and stopping. Right. And and I think uh, you notice that going throughout most of the tracks. There's interesting things, but they just they don't go on forever. That they stop and start or swap and change. So uh, there's a good syncopation to the various key parts and percussion parts, as you mentioned, because sometimes they were keyboardy inspired percussion parts. Right. Uh, a lot of the time, I think. Um, and that was good. That By stopping and starting the parts, uh, it meant that the engineer had a chance to put them all back in perspective so it didn't take over the tracks. Right.
And then when it became the dance versions of the songs, which went down very well, uh, especially Never You Done That and Hot You Cool, ended up number one on the end of the year Billboard 12-inch charts, which was shocking to me, as, as Vogue was number two. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Well, I mean, it shouldn't be shocking because... Again, back to the production and the, uh, I, you know, you guys just had a great package and people should really revisit these albums and um, and just enjoy them because there's a lot to enjoy, you know, particularly the first record. It's just, um, you know, it's pretty seamless. I mean, you just can go from beginning to end and and there's, uh, you know, there, there's no space for, uh, um, you know, it, it's all good. You know, it's all really good stuff. You know, there's songs that in the main part had been toured for a few months as well. As we'd been putting the band together, um, one gig being worth a thousand rehearsals, etc. Right. We'd done quite a lot of shows and that had helped some of the songs, at least in their recording. So they were organic. It was one, two, three, four, and everybody did the best they could. Right, three or four times, three times normally. Were uh, any of the um, were any of these songs on the first album? You know, kind of holdovers from uh, the beat days, or um, or or were they all had they all kind of been composed? To say, look, let's start try something fresh. Or were any of them kicking well, around? Well, no. Funnily enough, tenderness was exactly that, and uh, and was also a signal to me that the beats days might be coming close to the end because I couldn't get a rehearsal together mm. for anybody to bother to learn tenderness. Wow. I've got this song, I'd say. Ooh. And uh, I was only playing it really on the, this little Yamaha, a brown keyboard, uh, one finger on this hand, two fingers on the... Round and round and round, I was obsessed with it. And I'd got the lyrics going, and I said, listen, have a listen to this. Couldn't get anybody to have a listen. And even had, like, a cassette made. Yeah, I'll listen to this cassette. I've got this tune. Oh, yeah, very nice. And I tried to set up some rehearsals, and it became agonising. It was, um, okay, there's a rehearsal Tuesday from 11 o'clock till 4 o'clock. And then Tuesday, oh, I'm not going to be able to make 11 o'clock. Mm. I'm having this sink delivered. <laughs> right, right. They, were, they, they were, were all in domestic, lost in domestic they stuff. They were meant to be here at 10, Dave. It was meant to be done by now, but I can't stay. Anyway, they just called me. They think about two o'clock. Anyway, as soon as the sink's in, I'll be right over. Right. And, <laughs> and they get there at two o'clock. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Great new sink. Yeah, let me show you some pictures. No. Right. <laughs> and then somebody, oh, oh, no, is it three o'clock? Is that the time? Oh, I've got to be at the accountants at four, Dave. Right. I gotta go. So as the one was arriving for the rehearsal, <laughs> another one would be leaving, and so it was. We never, we never managed to rehearse tenderness. And mm. I gave up in the end. It was like sodis. <laughs> and tenderness is, you know, it's such a perfect little pop song, and I love it very much. Uh, and it's also got the honor of being featured in not one but two John Hughes films, both Sixteen Candles and and Weird Science. Am I right about that? You can't beat that, can you? No, you can't. Two John Hughes's. <laughs> it, it doesn't get any more 80s than that. He was very nice. I went to his house and he had a, a wall full of records behind him, just mm. like you. Just there like you this. Go. Without the plastic or it wasn't shining as much. I think they were naked. I don't think they'd got dust covers. Right. So you, you step up there. And he was very proud of them and said that he didn't have them done alphabetically. Mm. He had them done from the perspective of his pantheon of 80s music. So they were connected by influence rather than, you know, by style or country or wow. alphabetically by name. Test me, he said. Test me. Wow. Easy, I said. <laughs> You'll not get this. 
second tears for fears. He went, ran down, puff, got wow. it. Test me again, he said. Test me again. I'm like, first echo on the bunny man, you're stuck, mate. Ran down the other, got it. And I never caught him out. He knew, and it was like that, the size of that sort of wall. It was, it was a, a big one. It was a, a big record collection. Wow. Full of records. It was off-putting, just the same. But he knew where they all were. Or I didn't catch him out in a way. Soft sell then. <laughs> oh, too easy. Make it harder, Wakeling. And uh, <laughs> now that somebody would find the spare time to do that. Right. And make a lot of films about a certain point in teenage transitional life. That's another story to tell, probably. John, yeah. a deeper tale to tell there. But uh, I thought that was fascinating, and it showed his uh, passion for it. I met him. He came into a dressing room caravan in Orange County in California with his hand outstretched, the big fellow he seemed at the time, and he said, anybody who's got balls enough to put a bassoon on a pop record and have a hit is my kind of guy. Hello, my name's John Hughes. Wow. That was his first ever words to me. Um, we got on splendidly. Uh, not so much when he got big and famous. You know, you had to go through a number of... John's going to try to get right back to you. Right. <laughs> he had a... He had a uh, a machine. He was he was a part of the machine at that point, I guess, a little bit. Huge music. Hello, huge music. <laughs> oh dear. Well, it's interesting. You, you, know, you let these filmmakers play along with the music game, and then they get all excited and start opening music companies. It's like, oh no. <laughs> but um, it's the nature of the business, and he was that successful. Uh, I mean, to me. Uh, the beat, it, it, I've got a song and I have a tune in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but it appeared to me that the first time I saw it, even though I'd gone to visit them in um, Chicago where they were filming it at the right. baseball ground, I spent an afternoon there with them. Great fun. But when I saw the film, I thought it had jumped the shark. Mm. It was like, not even in the richest suburb of Chicago can anybody be blasé about the destruction of a priceless classic car. No, oh, it's all right, you know. We got lots of them. Oh, I have to call. Oh, I've got to go back down the auction. Right. <laughs> you guys, you've done it again. You goofy kids. You goofy kids crashing my whatever it was, Lamborghini. I don't even know <laughs> what it was, but it just it, it appeared to jump the shark. Right. Which I thought was a shame. And you know what? I was worried about it, right? And I saw it early on, like a premiere or something like that. You know, John got me tickets to sit up front and see it at a big showing of the thing. And it came out and it was like 10 minutes of travelogue with a uh, a helicopter filming in between the buildings in Chicago. And I was like, oh, dear, we're in trouble. <laughs> We've gone big time. Chicago, Chicago. I was like, oh, no, this could go either way. Right. And it, 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 it from one step to the other, I was a bit sad, really. Some good bits. Right. And some memorable bits I really like. The, the chase bit, mm -hmm. with music uh, in it, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da, which was actually mirroring the bathroom backwards. Oh, that's weird. <gasps> you got to write another song over the top of it. Boom. Classic. Another classic. At the yeah. same time, really. I'm going to try it with a few others. I wonder what tenderness backwards would sound like. Yeah, that is weird. Um, uh and it's curious that the, the John Hughes films really, uh, you know, and again, back to what I was saying about your production style and just the sound of uh, a lot of those groups. But of course, you guys in, in particular and, and your music, uh, those films are great films. I'm actually a big fan of John Hughes films, but um, 
uh, th the music was so integral to the strength of those films too. And it's interesting to learn about his record collection because I'd never heard that. So, and he I know, I knew so he was a serious, music guy. Though. Yeah, he took it he seriously. Wanted to be. Yeah. He wanted to be a musician and took doing films as his silver medal. Didn't get to be in a group. Right. But he got to make films instead was his take on this. And you're right, the music was integral because it, it set up moods for him, I think. A certain song set up a mood and the dialogue, which was quite fluid in his films, the dialogue got written and styled around the moods that, that the songs were giving him. Right. So, right. so then when you actually put it together in the film, all the bits match together because they do. <laughs> yeah. Well, he knew how to put the pieces together. Absolutely. He did. So that was excellent, wasn't it? He, and he could set up situations that would seem commonplace and then something quite profound could pop out of it and yeah. you out of the mouths of babes. So that was another good part of it. There was much redeeming about his films. I was just disappointed that it seemed Hollywood had got to him right? A bit too much with uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Hollywood can get to us all. You know, if look you at let me. it. I've had to move to the valley to keep at a distance. I'm 17 miles, which is at the same distance as uh, you have to be from a nuclear power station. There I you go. It's wise advice. You know, they'll eat you, eat you alive. It's the tough. I it's wish they easy. could. I, I could walk around Hollywood for days. Nobody had noticed me. It's a shame now. Uh, right. I'd have to. Wear, I'd have to wear a beat or a general public T-shirt. <laughs> walk around with a guitar over my shoulder. Oh yes. What made you? Oh, what made you notice? All yeah. right. How, yeah. how did you know? Yeah. How did you know? Yeah. So when you when you revisited these two albums for reissue, you know what was your involvement? Did you did you get a chance to what, have you sort of grappled with the differences between the originals and the new one, or or what's the um, you know what was the process of kind of the re, the reissue as they came up? We had a lovely big meeting, and then they've kind of BMG have done it their way. Yeah, they just informed me really. Um, I'd hoped to be a bit more involved, but uh, they seemed confident about it, and I'd sort of offered my services if they were required. Right. <laughs> so I'm still, that offer still stands. <laughs> well, they're out now, so I don't know what you could do about it now. But what What is it? What is it? You wake it mean? up in the morning. You wake up in the morning and it's one set of emails less that you're like, oh, no, God, I've got that at three o'clock, then that at four. Oh, God. Right. So, you know, you've got more chance of being in the garden or watching the world news on television in bed. Right, right. So on balance. But so, no, I would like to. I had expected to be a little bit more involved. But uh, it turns out they'd got a pretty good game plan. They're doing everything that you could expect them to be doing. All the right people are getting the record and uh, the records. And uh, it's more like, as we we did some shows this summer as general public, first time in a long time. Right. Yeah, only a few weeks, three or four weeks. And... Uh, just talking with people afterwards and the growing interest in it and the records being re-released at around the same time, uh, it's just given a nice slow burn of interest. Uh, oh, talking of which, uh, that one song, Burning Bright, mm. uh, is, is a lot of people are commenting about it on Twitter and Facebook. People are posting it. Uh it's a sort of plea for um, peace, love and unity. <laughs> no, not a bad time for it. Not a bad time for it at all, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so uh, so that was good. And, and I hadn't thought about that tune for a minute, really. Uh, but then, uh, sadly, when something dreadful happens, people post certain beat or general public songs and go, oh, could have written this about today then, Dave. 
Mm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good and bad, isn't it? They they were meant to be written as a warning, right? Forty years ago, let's not go down there then, right? Global warming, you know. Yeah. Whilst there's time then, and so now people say, no, well, that's timely. It's like, well, it's a shame, isn't it? Because probably a bit too late. It wasn't. It wasn't supposed to be. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to be timely. What does it mean to you? You know, to see these these albums reissued and 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 of course on vinyl on the medium that you remember uh, they were issued in forty years ago originally. Of course, what is it? What does it kind of mean to you to to come full circle and revisit them uh, all these years later? It's quite odd, and particularly because, as you mentioned, the migration vinyl all the way back to vinyl. Right. And um, the records were made with vinyl in mind. As you were in the recording studio, you'd often hear the producer, even more often the engineer go, oh, no, not when you try to cut it. <laughs> Right, they knew what the limitations go, were. Yeah, you go. What about? See, I've got, I've got an idea. What about? They like try cutting that. Right. Oh, okay. I'll go and sit at the back and pay then. Yes, good idea. Though, and sit in the back and pay. Um, and but they were made with those parameters in mind and. Uh, that's something to be said about it. Uh, analog recording systems were designed to capture as best they could the sounds of orchestral instruments. Mm -hmm. Orchestral instruments had been designed and redesigned over, what, two, five thousand years to try and get the best emotive sound that they could to touch heartstrings, you know, right. to move, move people's chakras or emotions, whichever, uh, or ear candy, all of it. Right. And, and so analog recording was uh, designed to record that, which is quite an emotional substance. And uh, the tracks between... Between each tracks, they would resonate against each other. When a song started to get hot, you'd hear this resonance, and it was just everything that was on tape was doing a kind of music of the spheres with each other right. that added up this kind of white noise, excitement. <gasps> what is that? Right, right. Uh, the magic of music is what it was. And so... Uh, there's something to be said about trying to maximise analogue tape. And we got the chance to compare and contrast because the beat records had been recorded digitally because of a cheap deal we got from a studio in London. Oh. <laughs> from a studio uh, in London. Yeah, from a studio in London. I was trying to think of the group. So uh, they were digital and, and the general public Brom, were analogue. Brom Records. Brom Records. Okay. Uh, Jerry Brom. And he bought this 3M system. Yeah, yeah, the early 3M. And and they couldn't get it to work. Hmm. It would keep crapping out. It would do great for ages. Then it would make this clicking noise, and it would be across everything, all right. tracks. And Crazy. They Jerry, one of Jerry Bronze bands, a big heavy metal band, forget the name now, mm. uh, They'd been trying to make an album and it kept messing up and they gave up. And so this deal of the century came in like £40 an hour instead of £80 an hour mm -hmm. for this fantastic 32-channel digital board. And if anything goes wrong, you get one, two or three days free on top, depending on how much it's screwed up. Can't and beat it, that. You can't beat that. And then they invented a board that they brought in to put into this thing, that, which was about the size of three freezers for anybody who does things like has a whole deer, mm -hmm. Venice, right, one right, for beef and one for lamb. Well, there's some chickens in with the lamb because you don't need that much lamb. Right, uh, sausages. 
uh, it was about the size of that, if you can imagine it. And they would put this board in, and it stopped the clicks from happening. Hmm. But they didn't know how. They didn't know what it did to hmm. stop the clicks happening. There was a presumption that it was some sort of build-up of static somewhere. Yeah, it just worked, uh, whatever it was. Whatever it was just worked. Mm. And so uh, we made the beat records there. And um, for better and worse, really, the digital allowed you uh, to do things that you wouldn't be able to hear until somebody invented the CD. Right, <laughs> right. Because you couldn't master them onto the vinyl, especially bass amounts of bass. Yeah, which is be- where you were going too with the dance stuff. You know, the the dance well, remixes had to have that. Uh, but the twelve to- inches had a little more space. I guess you could get away. Yes, with they got more space. You had to be te- dreadfully careful of the inner inside track, track five normally, right. of the album because unless. Uh, you were conservative with the bass on track one. You didn't give it everything it would take. Uh, you could end up with no capacity for any bass at all on the last track. Right. And we did that with the first mastering of the first general public record. It was going great until, and in fact, it was burning, burning bright. Mm. Uh, which was written around its bass line, bum bum, but a bump, but a bum 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 bump, but a bump, but a bum 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 bump, but a bump, but a bump, but a bump, and it wasn't wasn't there at all. It was like that, that, that. There was no bass whatsoever. So back to the drawing board, we had to steal a bit of bass back off the four tracks before, and keep trying to add some to the last track so it didn't sound stupid. Mm. And then CDs came about, and it was like, well, turn the bass up on everything, really. Mm. Which track? Yeah. Another lot. You got unlimited space, right? Well, it must be interesting to, you know, re- you're revisiting all these memories and these things that you uh, you had to go through to get these records done, and uh, and here you are, forty years later, you know, thinking about those moments, and the, and, and even the limitations are kind of you, you know, I'm sure you have fond memories of uh, uh, of that jigsaw puzzle, you know. Well, I'm a bit like you. I'm waiting for my copy too. What's waiting. up with that? Well, then it makes me feel better. If you didn't get a copy, I didn't get my uh, copies either. I'm told that the BMG juggernaut, when it gets into gear and it starts barreling, uh, that's when I'm going to get my copy. And oddly enough, I would relish one because for the first time in many years, well, for a few years now, but for the first time since many years before then, yeah. I have a record player. And and it's odd because uh, not only the general public releases, but a, a English beat release that's coming up later in the year, they're only on vinyl. Right. So it's really gone full circle. We're now going back to a time... Well, we're pretending, never mind about the CD, the cassette. Right. Still hasn't been invented. When do they bring in the cassette back? Uh, well, they're working on it. So let me just clarify. Are you, so the English beat records really were, uh, uh, it's funny because they were digital recordings. I mean, they were, they were all of them, or the earlier ones were, none. the earliest ones were in analog? No. Wow. At, at, at the Roundhouse Studios, Jerry Brom. Brom Records. Uh, I don't think there's a studio in there. I got to play next door in the actual roundhouse, which holds about 3,000. Mm. And uh, we had about two and a half, I think. And it was plenty anyway. Uh, right next door to where the records were made. That was odd. And I thought, well, that's going to bring back a lot of memories, isn't it, Dave? And I stood there and I was like... Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> you're having you're having a big vinyl year, by the way, because uh, these aren't the only uh, records that are featured in a release this year. the The English Beat has a release too coming out for Record Store Day November, the the Black Friday, right? That's right. We do indeed an expanded version of uh, the first album. I just can't stop it. Right. Which, by hook or by crook, I'm not sure, has ended up with 
three versions of Tears of a Clown on a double album. That's a lot of versions of Tears of a Clown. Yeah, I think so. You know, and I like the song. I like when Smokey sings, I yeah. hear violins. But I don't know, three times I did um I did mention it, but it was too late. Mm. Uh, it, uh, from the record collector's point of view, of course, you'd want to have the original two-tone single release, uh, and you'd want the American seven-inch single edit, and and also the regular album version. Of right. course, if you were a record collector, right? Because if you're a record collector, you have to have the lot, don't you? So this is a good way of getting the loss on that song. But yeah. I thought I thought it was a bit much. I, th- I thought, from the point of view of somebody who just liked to put it on and dance around in the kitchen, um, the, a, a, two versions, all right, right. if you have to, and then a, a version of something else. I, I suggested, um, got nowhere. Well, it was too late, really, anyway. So I was decent about it, but it seemed a little bit odd to me. Right. And I, but it was a conversation worth having, I think, because I've noticed that there can become a difference between uh, album compilations and track listings that are put together for catalogists. Right versus the people I see at my concerts who go, oh, yeah, you're going to do get a job, Dave. Right. Which would have been a song I would have put on instead. Uh, so fans' favourites from the concerts. Uh, and I'm wary of it. I haven't seen anything really flagrant from Rhino. I think they seem pretty decent, like Shout Factory. But sometimes with these uh, compilations, especially around the two-tone world, it seems as though they make it just a different enough so, so that anybody who for 40 years has been proud enough to say, I've got every bloody album, every bloody one, uh, well, they, every... they're going to have to buy this one as well. And, and sometimes there doesn't really seem to be enough to make them have to do that. If you've got a load of extra stuff or a different take, that's that's one thing, but often they're a bit lacking on that. It's just a different colour bag and now different coloured vinyl. Right. So, but at least they've given it some thought and and I think they're right. Uh, a certain, the, the catalogist uh, set of fans We'll probably appreciate, yeah. All three versions of Tears of a Clown, mate. Got I'm I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to listen to him twice. I'm going to listen to it six times just six to get the times, just to know. get the full effect. Uh, you know, if I'm correct, your one and only solo album, uh, No Warning, it was released in 91 and never had a a proper vinyl release. And I'm going to make a suggestion right here, right now. I'm going to say next year's Record Store Day or something. Perfect. What do you think? Perfect. I'm putting it out in the I'm putting it out there into the universe. It's it's odd this record store day, isn't it? Really? It's it's funny to see the turnaround of the music industry in such a way, uh, right from the beginning of my career to this part of it. It's really odd. Uh, there's been highlight moments, uh 10, 15, 12 years ago, maybe. And my house is reverberating to Bob Marley's first album. Mm. The walls are shaking, the glasses. <laughs> and it's my daughter, teenage daughter upstairs. Right. Right. And I'm downstairs being my dad. Do you have to listen to it that bloody loud? Right. Turn it down a little. Can't hear myself think, you know. But before I went for that... I listened to it, and because it was on vinyl, there was something very attractive and inviting and warm and non-threatening about it. It mm. drew you in, and uh, and it reminded me right there and then about uh, the power of vinyl recordings 
how they had managed to capture the emotional quality of the orchestra. And so they'd managed to do that with the electrical instruments and voices as well. Uh, and there is something to be said about it when they get it right. On average, I would say nowadays, probably an average digital recording with digital mastering probably sounds better than a lot of stuff that people are handcrafting analog. But when you get an analog one right, right. Uh, it can make a moment in time. Um, I would say... Uh, some Rolling Stone singles did that for me. Nineteenth Nervous Breakdown, particularly, I think. Yeah. Uh, satisfaction. There's the, an ambiance about it uh, that just captures the moment as well. And you hear it, you immediately remember the moment when you first heard that right. song. Uh, are you? Are you? Do you still buying records? You said you have a record player, and our our John Myers, our fearless leader here at the Vinyl District, he he said he's got a fun memory of record shopping with you at one at some point. I don't know what the story was there, but I don't know if you remember that occasion. But you know, you say you have a record player now. I guess you've been buying some records, or what? Where where are you at now with you it? You know, I'm not very um, not very adventurous at all. I'm afraid I'm buying up albums that I missed. Mm. Like, oh, look at that. Trout mask replica, only eighteen ninety nine. You can't beat that. You know what I mean? And it's delivered to the house the next day. Right. No fuss, no bother. Uh, eighteen ninety nine. Now, I did have uh, an autographed copy of that and half a dozen other um, Captain Beefheart records all with very witty and cryptic little bits, and right. then Van Vliet. So, uh, you know, divorce cases go in the way they do, autographed records, you know. There should be a special section in that wall behind you for any autographed ones with a lock on them. That I can just grab quickly. See if you needed to with a bag, <laughs> a brain bag, just no, for maybe 50, you know. Well, yeah. I, I don't have the organization that John here oh, I, I can grab some things pretty fast. I know where to go. You know, I know well, where to go. I wish I'd have known that. It's nice to pass that sort of advice on to a younger man where it still <laughs> might make some difference. But unfortunately, no, it went. Uh, and so I got a new copy of that. I thought it sounded great. Um, and I got a few of my reggae ones that I'd lost or I'd worn out. Mm. So I got, actually, I got two just to compare. <laughs> well, uh, so, some of those early pressings of those, uh, uh, you know, reggae classics are, uh, and, and of course, deep, deep cuts are incredibly expensive now. This is a very expensive uh, world. Isn't it? Yeah. But um, I think it's worth it. Um, yeah. The sound is worth it, uh, especially, I think, if it's analog recorded music. Right. really suits it. And then if it's analog instruments as well. Oh, right. Then you really see it get into its, its, its forte, you know. Um, the trouble is nowadays, I think, uh, the people from the radio have become accustomed to the idea that music is metronomic. Doop, 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 doop. Oh, I like that one. Doop, right. doop, doop, doop. And most songs start off doop, 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 and finish doop, doop, doop. Right. They don't, they don't really change tempo like they used to, you know, like in the olden days. Um well, it's funny. We were talking about the production of the uh, of the of your albums, and and you were you know you talk about a bridge or you know the these these unexpected things that you know you don't really hear a bridge anymore, right? You, you don't hear a lot of bridges on the radio. It's true. Just a chorus with the instruments dropped out. Yeah, not a lot of middle eights. Brown Sugar was twice as many beats per minute on the fade out as it is on the intro. I guess so. I have to I have to listen to that. I know you, you know, but it is uh, by design. It would, it, it turns out, you know, that's what they meant. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you would have 
plan that on a, a tempo map. Well, and that's what keeps your brain interested too. That's what keeps your your interest. You're connected because it's changing. It's the same, but it's changing. It's a little different. It 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 it, uh, it grows. Like heartbeats are yeah. not the same as the beats on a computer, are they? Right. When our hearts accelerate, they it, it's not linear. Our hearts leap with excitement, um, or get heavy with sadness. Mm. Uh, and it's slightly different from metronomic. You can you can have a metronome going, I suppose, and if you know what you're doing, you can play with time to give it human expression rather than playing in time right. with the external factor. Um, and that's the one thing I do notice on general public songs because some were done with click tracks. Roger was now firmly ensconced in the synth world right. and and made all of his demos with click tracks. They they didn't now come as rough ideas. They were concertos for one finger yeah. <laughs> keyboard parts. Right. Just massive. Even backing vocals on them like, oh wow. So they became harder. You couldn't change them. He was married to them so much time and effort. Right. Uh, you've got to be careful with that. If you want somebody to do something with a song, you have to give it to them earlier enough on before you've finished it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you do it afterwards, we found out, I would say, oh, what about this bit here? This is your best bit, Rog. No, oh, no, I really like that bit. Okay. Uh, what about, oh, yeah, what about here? I thought you could use this bit and then go straight in. Oh, really? Oh, I like that bit. Okay. <laughs> right. He was in love and with everything. We did a few of those, and then we got together one last time on the matter, and he said, well, tell me what you can do with them tracks then, Dave. I said, well, I know what I can do with them, Roger. I can give them a jolly good listening to. Mm -hmm. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you won't let me do anything. Right. Because each part of those songs, even down to the third percussion track, I said they're all absolutely precious to you. At this right. point, you've spent so much time and love over them that you can't hear it. And any other any change to that sounds like a mistake to you. Mm. So we're stuck, and we kind of were really. Uh, he he loosened off a bit when we got in the studio, and would sometimes accept an idea or two from the producer which I noticed. So, <laughs> so I'd feed the producer on ideas. And right. Then, you needed a... Uh, you needed hey, a Raj, I had an idea for... What do you got? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. We'd have a go. From a different so person. I'd, I'd get the result, but no acclaim. I'd right. have to... I couldn't say anything, otherwise that avenue would be cut off. Right. But, um, was what it was. Roger just loved his music so much. It was, I thought sometimes unhealthy almost. It wasn't like compared to David and Andy who wanted a couple of years off and st stop having to do this all the time. Right. Roger, especially once the synthesizers and home recording came in, he was just obsessed. It took over from <laughs> space invaders and slot machines. He was just there all day, every day, at the synthesizer. Mm. He was just absolutely obsessed with it. Melody after melody after melody. Never you done that, uh, which I think still is probably, well, at least one of my favourite uh, general public songs. Mine too. I particularly like the uh, twelve-inch mix. Chelly, uh, sorry, it's um, Arthur Baker. Um, around the same time as Born in the USA, <laughs> it's got the same <laughs> snare on it. Right. And, um, <laughs> All right. Right. The right, right. New York Ballad. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, well, it sounded really good. Uh, but that came from uh, one of uh, Roger's synthesizer noodlings. And luckily, it was a, a baby song when it first showed up on <laughs> one of his demo tapes. He thought it was good, but he wasn't sure what he'd got here. And it was the basic tune for Never You Done That. So luckily, me and Mickey Billingham got our hands on that one. Right. You got to do more with it. Um, of course, of course, we lost Roger in 2019. And how do you think uh, how do you think he'd react to seeing these records uh, being released again uh, today in the year 2023? What do you think his his impressions would be? I think he'd be very pleased with the response, because apart from what was in the songs or what the songs were about, he was always of the mind that general public particularly, but the Beats as well, uh, had the reputation for only delivering quality product. Mm. That uh, if you got a record from the Beats or general public, you knew that they were quality songs, quality recordings. And so I think he would be pleased uh, that they've been received with that in mind, like, oh, they've kind of stood the test of time, oh, they seem like tight productions. Uh, and they managed to have just about survived the 80s. They didn't get too synthesised out that there was no songs left. It was just samples or, you know, yeah, 80s emotions. <laughs> right. Unidentified angst. That was good. I, that, that, that 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 you hit the nail on the head there. That was really you. Yeah, you, no, you knew that. I, I don't do the videos like I used to, but I could. <laughs> I can still, still do them. Uh, so we managed to avoid that a little bit. Yeah, I think you did. Which was good, uh, and we had nice characters: Mickey Billingham, uh, sardonic. Uh, but a brilliant keyboardist uh, and a nifty lyricist also, and Horace, who'd been part of the engine of the specials um, and had seen all of that, uh, kind of acting like the seasoned old hand, but mm. always holding it down steadily. Even when it was going wrong, he'd right. still he'd still be playing in time, even if he was the only one who was. Everybody else had spun out. Whoa! Yeah. Is this the verse or the chorus? Right. And Horace, boom, 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 boom. Resolute, reliable. Mm. Uh, so it was an interesting set of uh, characters that me and Roger got to play with, uh, which helped a bit, I think. Uh, I just got to see, I think it was MTV New Year's Eve. It was probably 84, but it might have been 83, who knows. Mm. And it was a live thing. Uh, us, Frankie Goes to Hollywood and UB40. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but they just, it just got a twittering. <laughs> in the last couple of days, I just saw it again. Fantastic. Yeah. A really a really great live version of Never You Done That. Um, like a lot of songs, you master them in the first tour after you've made an album. Right. You, know, you do your recorded version and you sit and talk about it. You go, you know what you should have done there? You're right. Now it's too late. Now and you can so, do it live, though. You can do it live, right? Final, final tightening. All right. Oh, I thought that was E minor. A minor. Uh, whoops. My bad. That's oh. what give, that's what gives it the magic. That's why they ducked it down so far in the mix because you're doing the wrong thing. You know that'll sound fine with a bit of reverb on it. Right. It's too quiet, so you can't hear it with a cymbal on top. Psh! Yeah. yeah, sound great. Um, and so you got to tighten them up. But it was a terrific version of Never You Done That. And then a version of Tenderness, which was really good and had a stage invasion where nobody in the band could see each other, but the song went on. Wow. Which is, I mean, 
anybody do anybody can do it when you can see the band. Right. Piece of cake, and you've got a visual and the audio. But just the audio. Spot on it was. So we were a good live group, that's for sure. Uh which I'd remembered, but I hadn't actually seen anything until quite recently. I saw those uh, clips on Twitter. That's the magic magic of the internet. It's bring, it's a, a time machine. It brings you back to those days. Well, David, I, I thank you so much for your time today. This was a really enjoyable chat, and uh, I really enjoyed revisiting these albums, and we hope that BMG sends them to us soon, which I'm, I'm sure they will be. And, I can, uh, after this interview, I bet they will. <laughs> and, mark, and, the time, mark the time on this bit for us to let me know. I can say, oh, by the way. Right. And, and I'm ready you know, for... they've probably sold so many, they don't have any promo copies left. I think they're probably flying out. They're flying out off the shelves, and they don't have any for, for you and me. So they'll have to... We'll have to wait till the second pressing. Second pressing, we'll have to be patient. Vinyl coming from Hungary. <laughs> oh, that's good. There was a plant in Hungary, the old uh, Hunger, Hungertron uh, classical records. I wonder what happened to that plant. It must be gone. Well, it's funny. We uh, Two Nights to Talk To video uh, has a segment in it. Well, it goes from writing a song, recording it, mastering it, making a record and bringing it out. Mm. And so we, we spent an afternoon filming ourselves being pop stars in a factory where they were making vinyl discs. Absolutely abhorrent. Right. They've got like coats on with big holes burnt in them and rags wrapped around their heads and their hands and big red burns on the back of their hands. It was really grotesque. <laughs> and uh, and then they closed them all down, didn't they? And then it turned out they were an environmental nightmare. But then the good news, they're still running them in Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, they, I, yeah. I, I imagine it's a little bit different nowadays. In fact, I just I just visited one in the Netherlands a few weeks ago, and it was really all cleaned up, is it? It was really cool. What's that? All cleaned up now. Oh yeah, it was really nice. It was a really great tour, and uh, they the uh, re it was called Record Industry in Harlem, Netherlands, and uh, really really a cool visit. Very very modern, but but they had the old. Uh, pressings that so the the machines that Sony used to use. So it was a mix nice. of old and new, but it was a really cool plant. Well, Rhino are telling me that this new record that's going to come out from the beat, uh, it's been remastered. And they said, you know, just even in the last two years, especially with the AI stuff, just everything that's opened up in terms of mastering, you can make anything sound like anything now. Yeah. So the state of the art has, has gone way high. Um, right. He said, with the remastering, he said, and to be honest, more than anything else, the quality of the vinyl and the way that the tracks are put to the vinyl, he said, we're getting some records. They sound better than the copies, the original copies that fans have still got, you know, once or twice played. Fascinating. Really, really cool. So what they're doing with AI. The quality of uh, the vinyl is as good, if not better, than what made us love it in the first place. Right, right. Fascinating. Well, David, again, I thank you well, very much. Lifetime. Good job you didn't throw them records away. <laughs> I didn't. Well, I got rid of some things along the way. Never got I, rid of it. Never, get, oh, never it? get rid of stuff. Not divorced enough nope. time. Still have had that chiseled away, and there you are. That's a um, gold mine there. Uh, You're on the gold mine. Unless, of course, there's a flood or a uh, fire. I you know. know. I've had a, a friend in New Orleans who lost a collection like that. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. You gotta. You gotta cross your fingers. It's really a, a finger cross. I do what I can, but I. It, you do have to just hope for the best. You know, and to get the brown bag in the corner by the door. Just in case you have to do a runner, a Dixie's Midnight Runner bag. <laughs> Absolutely. Will do. Anything, anything Elvis or, you know, well, have a look through. You can have a look. They've got lists now. Anything that's worth anything. Oh, Just don't worry. I got it all listed. I know what I got over here. A special little sticker on those in case you got to get them quick. <laughs> <That's Yeah. right. laughs> Very best of luck to you, sir. Thank you, that's sir. Sounds and... great in there. What's that? I bet it smells great. Yeah, sometimes if I come downstairs and the humidity is just right, it smells like a record store. I get that 
that shot. So that's a good feeling. You think someone's going to pop? Hey, new Bloodwind pig. Put one aside for you, David. That's right. That's it. <laughs> right, right. I love that. Splendid. Lovely talking.